Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce to you now. Danny Conway is a distinguished board-certified functional nutrition, nutrition practitioner and holistic health expert. Danny brings over 17 years of experience to her mission of empowering women to break free from the diet mentality. With a passion for helping women achieve weight loss goals, increased energy, and renewed self-confidence, Danny's holistic approach has transformed the lives of many. Danny boasts a diverse range of certifications in holistic health modalities and specializes in personalized nutrition strategies, ranging from low-carbohydrate diets to carnivore diets. Her primary focus centers on identifying and addressing the root causes of hormonal and gut issues, facilitating comprehensive body rebalancing from the inside out. Recognizing the unique needs of women over 40, Danny dedicates her practice to one-on-one -on -one consultations and group programs, all customized to individual requirements. She firmly believes that there is no one-size-fits-all solution to achieving optimal health. She is a well-known figure in the field of holistic health and shares her insights on the ketogenic diet, carnivore diet, intermittent fasting, and her innovational undiet approach. Danny Conway, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you to Boundless Body Radio. Thanks so much for having me, Casey. It's awesome to be here. <laughs> it's such an honor to host you. In the introduction, we mentioned that you work primarily with women and primarily with women over 40. You work with everybody. Oh. So I just wanted to clarify that. That's just where your specialty is. You do help all kinds of people out there. And also from your introduction, I realized that I can't ask you what I'm still waiting for one of my podcast guests to tell me, which is how should we be eating? Just tell us what to eat. We'll, we'll cut the podcast. We'll be done. And that will be the end of it. <laughs> Right. I wish it was that easy, but I do think that everyone should be eating animal-based foods, protein and fat as the staple or foundation of their diet. <laughs> That's a good start. We can still get into the sticks on a lot of the particulars as far as that goes, but that is a very good start. Um, Absolutely. I, <laughs> I got to meet you in person this last year at KetoCon. KetoCon this next year is rebranding to Hack Your Health, I believe is the name of it. And um, mm -hmm. as I was preparing to go to my very first KetoCon last year, 2023, I was looking at the events and the speakers and was so excited to you know meet you and meet uh, Kevin Stock and Sally Norton and so many former podcast guests on the show. And it was such a wonderful time. And one of the events that really caught my eye that I, I wanted to make sure that I was at was a panel discussion all about women and carnivore diets. And first of all, I just thought to myself, like, it's so amazing that in 2023, we are having a panel discussion that's women with carnivore diets like that. That's amazing to think back like five or 10 years ago. You, you wouldn't have that. That would be ridiculous. So I decide I want to go to this. I'm going to attend. Let me get there like 15, 20 minutes early. The room, <laughs> you, you're laughing. The room was <laughs> bursting at the seams. There was no place to hardly sit. I was sat in the front corner <laughs> on the ground. I saw Sally Norton there. She was sitting on the ground as well. And it was a wonderful discussion. And regardless of everybody's opinions and what they thought of things, I just, I marveled at the fact that we could pack an entire room full of men and women who are curious yeah. about the carnivore diet. What an amazing thing. <laughs> Yeah, it was awesome. I remember um, as we were sort of getting ready to go on the little stage and in, in the breakout room, people just kept coming and coming and there was men and there was women, even though this was supposed to be like a quote unquote women's panel. So that just shows how um, hungry for information, no pun intended, but hungry for the information um, that people are wanting to, you know, heal and rebalance their bodies from the inside out. What is the right way to do that? Looking at individual nuance, a lot of the questions, obviously, we we answered as well as we could, you know, you know in front of a, a group, so to speak. But my um, sort of passion is that one size doesn't fit all. And looking at the nuance and the context for each person and how that plays out and all of that good stuff. Yeah, it's amazing. It was wonderful. I recorded it so I could listen to it again. And I got so much information out of uh, what is a complicated subject. And I just think about the work of people like yourself, the other panelists that were there, that They've been getting this message out to the point that we're past the kind of like, can I, can I eat meat and, you know, never poop again, or will I die of a heart attack for the most part? We kind of have some good ideas about that. We're getting now into the more complicated things. It's because you have been at this for so long and doing this work and getting it out there. I think it really helps to educate the public because they ask some really good questions. Yeah, definitely. And I think that, you know, there's still people that are newly introduced to carnivore as a diet, meat only diet and have the, you know, what happens with fiber? Do I poop? All those questions. Um, and then they're definitely, you know, there's definitely now the sort of deeper dive of, okay, this is beneficial and looking, you know, looking at, you know, how this is going to affect somebody long-term, what are the benefits and all of those kinds of things. 
Yeah, I, I, yeah, it's such a good point, and there's so much nuance to all of this. And again, I think this is why mm-hmm. your work is so amazing, and why you do take that approach of there's there's no one size fits all. You have to individualize things. So let's talk about your own personal journey. I actually don't know that much about how you got interested in health, and you've been doing a carnivore diet yourself for a very long time. How did that all come to be? So I was 65 pounds overweight on a fat free diet in my 20s. Um, I was doing hours of cardio, hours of spin classes, uh, chicken, brown rice, and broccoli, all the bro diets, um, uh, Weight Watchers counting points, trying to eat as little fat as possible, and not getting anywhere, gaining, losing, gaining, losing, gaining, losing. And I was just tired of all of the the yo-yo and the, you know, the, the hamster wheel, so to speak. So that really sent me on a path looking for something different. Um, One of my biggest struggles was hunger and cravings. Um, And I was always craving fatty foods. I was always craving ice cream. I always say like there was never a shortage of ice cream happening in my body. But what was I short on? Good quality protein, good quality fat. Um, So around uh, in my quest uh, for a different way, because all the ways that I had tried weren't working, um, I sort of fell into like low carb keto at the time was a big focus on Atkins um, 20 or less carbs and, um, increasing protein and fat. I always tell people that if you think that it's not mainstream now, uh, go back to 2006, 2007 and trying to do a quote unquote low carb or keto diet. Well, we all know that ketogenic diet has been around for a lot of years for uh, medical, um, issues and things like that. Um, it wasn't really looked at as far as like a regular way of eating. So I just decided to start transitioning because all of the other stuff wasn't working. So I had nothing to lose. Um, And then as time progressed, um, I started to lose some weight. I started to feel better. I started to get more control of my hunger and cravings. Um, I still had some hormone and gut issues. And that's where I, um, around 2008, got into the functional medicine and um, functional medicine certifications and things like that. Um, And then kind of fast forward a little bit, a few more years, my first experience, um, I should say experience and experiment personally um, with uh, uh, intentionally doing carnivore was around 2012. Um, And so everything else from there just kind of progressed and, you know, always continue to better myself, my hormones, my gut health. Um, I had breast implants. I had those removed a few years ago. So I have, you know, big story around that. Um, but oh, just over time, um, I realized that, um, you know, actually I should say soon after I started on the nutritional side of things and just got into the functional medicine, I figured that I wasn't the only woman struggling with fat-free diets, lack of weight loss, yo-yoing, all the hunger, all the cravings and issues in my early 20s Well, doctor said, oh, your blood work is normal. So my question was, then why do I still feel like crap? Yeah. So that's, again, we're getting into the functional testing and just sort of things progressed from there. Um, You know, I got laid off from my corporate job uh, soon after I met my now husband. um, And he said, you know, congratulations, you've just earned yourself all the time in the world to do everything you've always wanted to do. So I was like, what? (laughs) Um, But that led to my certifications and my practice and obviously super grateful for um, where, you know, every, everything that I've done, all the opportunities. I mean, I, you know, there was no social media back then. I started with in-person workshops and local fitness studios and gyms and, you know, teaching people about higher fat and higher protein and lower carb. And, you know, with my PowerPoint slide and, and, and no Zoom calls and all of that. So um, it's really been sort of just the gamut over the last, you know, 16, 17 plus years of of uh, progress and progression of, of where I've come from. You're an OG in the space. That's for sure. <laughs> Pretty cool. Um, okay. So you, you mentioned that you started the Atkins diet because everything else wasn't working. How much persuasion did you need? Like, what was your trepidation like? surely you must have had some reservations or thought that like, can I really eat this much fat? If I was gaining fat, not eating fat or eating low fat, how, how is this going to work if I start eating more fat and all the calories? Like, did you, did you hesitate at all before like jumping into that? Um, so trying to like really sort of think back, um, you know, like I said, I had a lot of cravings and I also, I remember sort of this distinct moment of like, craving steak and craving cheese and feeling like, 
well, what if I just ate those foods? Like, what would happen if I just ate those foods? So I think I didn't really, I mean, you know, that was a lot of years ago. So I don't, maybe there was more trepidation. Um, but I also was like, like I said, well, what I'm doing isn't working. So the worst thing that could happen is I could do this other thing. I could eat these other foods and it still wouldn't work, you know? So there wasn't a lot of concern, more of like, you know, well, what if, what if I just try this and it does work? Yeah, I see. And the red meat thing, I find this more common, especially with women. Um, it seems like regardless of what diet you're on, if you're trying to get more animal protein, whether you're doing low carb or carnivore or whatever, it seems like women, when they first transition on red meat is kind of tough and, and difficult to get them to want. And they'll start with like chicken and fish, but before long, it'd be like, okay, I'll have a nibble of steak. Okay. Maybe I'll have a little bit more steak to all of a sudden, uh, I, most of the women that I know turn red meat savage <laughs> over time. And, and I think it's their body really recognizing where those nutrients that their body needs is truly coming from. Is that something you've noticed as well? Yeah. So I would say there's sort of a few things with that first. Yes. I think that just the, the brainwashing of dieting of the dieting culture and red meat is bad is where people come from. So they might not realize that their story is red meat is bad. So I'm going to eat chicken and fish and lighter white meats kind of thing. Um, and the other piece of that puzzle is digestive function. So if they're not eating a lot of red meat and they're not eating a lot of meat protein in general, and they're relying on countless other plant-based proteins, uh, they might not, or they've been vegetarian or vegan for any period of time, they don't have the digestive capacity to digest meat as they might need to. So that's why they might feel like, I can't digest those foods or I can't have those foods or whatever their story is around that. So I do think that some of it is mental. Some of it could be like digestive, uh, low digestive capacity. Um, and so it can take time to build that up. There can be strategies to build that up. Um, and uh, again, just kind of, you know, there's the, the fear of it shifting into like, it's okay to eat red meat. It's okay to eat these foods. My body can accept these foods. Um, you know, and I, you know, I always say like our bodies hear everything our mind says. So if our mind is saying no red meat, red meat is bad. I eat chicken or fish, blah, 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 whatever that story is, the body is going to also possibly reject it because we're stuck in that sort of cycle. Whereas if they say to themselves, I feel safe eating red meat, I feel good eating red meat. I accept eating red meat, those types of, um, affirmations, if you will, that can really help with the process. That's a really good way to explain it. Just even remembering that digestive issue, like you're right, like you're not going to have the right amount of enzymes or your stomach acidity might be a little bit different. Oh, yeah. yeah. So like you said, you might need some help for a little while. We would hope that over time, everything would kind of restore back to normal, but um, important to know that there are those um, things that can help along the way. Um, back to your personal story. So that was the transition kind of going from, you know, going from like, I guess, normal dieting to like low carb dieting, what was it like to then transition into carnivore and get rid of the rest of the plant foods? So it was pretty easy for me. Um, so I, I mentioned part of my story is my breast implants. So I, I had them removed in March of 21. Um, I got them around 2012 and I started having a sort of a, uh, uh, what is the right word? <laughs> Relapse of symptoms. Um, of digestive issues and things that had been gone for quite a few years prior to that. Um, I blamed the anesthesia. I blamed the surgery. I blamed a lot of other things except the actual breast implants themselves, themselves, because I was in denial. You know, I was, um, you know, it was just, there's a lot of stuff. Obviously I was, you know, heading into my forties at that point in time, feeling like, you know, having this sort of midlife crisis. I was a health practitioner and then I started having issues. And then it was like a super shameful time of like, I got these implants and here I am helping other women rebalance their hormone and digestive issues. And I have just now created a lot more hormone and digestive issues for myself that I had gotten over. So anyway, so try to make a long story short, back to your question. Um, after that sort of relapse of symptoms, I started doing a lot of um, bone broth fasting and meat only meals and uh, intermittent fasting. So I noticed that when I went from uh, when I had longer periods of time between dinner the night before and breakfast the next day, I felt much better digestively and energetically. 
So that was sort of my fall into intermittent fasting before people were actually doing it on purpose kind of thing. Um, and so from there, as far as carnivore um, went, I, you know, just total transparency, I did, you know, would add veggies back here and there and then would feel crappy and then would take them out again and, you know, sort of had this um, on again, off again, because I was, you know, in denial that it was the implants, number one. And number two, I couldn't possibly want to be one of those people that couldn't tolerate plants. So there was a lot of sort, there was a lot of that, um, you know, again, this was like 2012. So like I always say, like, we think that carnivore and keto aren't so mainstream now. They're way more mainstream than they were then. And even in the functional health space, there is a lot of pushback on low carb, low carb for hormones, low carb, you know, no fiber for gut health and all that stuff. So I sort of was having like this, this is my own experience, but yet also being in, you know, involved with practitioner forums and things like that, that were the other sort of, you know, chatter boxes in the background of like, it should be this way. You should have fiber, you know, all of those things. So, um, you know, just total transparency, that sort of uh, the bouncing back and forth that I had done, you know, um, from a mindset perspective and my own experience over the years. Yeah. Interesting. On the topic of implants, I'm starting to hear more and more of this happening, that the, the term explant is becoming more and more popular. What are some ways that people might know that like they, they may need to get that done? So the reality is, um, Nobody can prove until the implants are out and someone has uh, a reversal or remission of symptoms that it was the implants. Now, that being said, there are a lot of cases of women out there with, um, you know, I, for me, I call it breast implant toxicity. I wasn't as ill or sick as many women are with breast BII, breast implant illness. Um, but a lot of women have, you know, onset of uh, 100%, you know, uh, intense autoimmune type symptoms, hormone issues, all kinds of things that are this started when and they, you know, were almost gone within days, weeks, months of the explant, meaning the removal of the of the implants. Um, so, you know, yes, it's becoming more popular, which is great as far as like discussing it and I always tell people, do the research that you don't want to do if you're considering it. You know, uh, of course, there's people out there that live for years healthily without, you know, with their implants. And that's great. All the more power to them. Um, that wasn't my situation. And that wasn't a lot of the situations of clients that I work with and other women that I've helped since, you know, explanting or they may have decided to explant after seeing my story and then realizing that a lot of their symptoms were related to um, to that sort of time frame of, of life. Gotcha. Well, I appreciate that. Um, that's really helpful information. I remember, I believe it was like Danica Patrick talking about hers and all the symptoms that she experienced. And she also had to do that surgery. And I, I want to say, if I remember right, it was within like a days or a week or something, she was feeling much, much better after having them removed. So very interesting topic. Um, back to the topic of food and, and carnivore diet. Obviously you've had really great result eating plenty of, of animal protein and animal fats. Do you notice that pretty much across the board with the people you work with? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, chronic under eating is rampant as, among women, um, over 40 and under 40, um, and especially not getting enough protein or animal based fats. So I do find that, you know, just the increase of those macronutrients, um, I really view nutrition as the foundation for everything that we do. And if food isn't right, nothing else can be right. Um, but if food is right and we are eating the right amount of protein, fat, and I like to say carbs, if someone is eating carbs, because I don't believe that everyone should be zero carb or has to be zero carb or even 10 grams of carbs, um, the rest, you know, the hormones, the gut health, the detoxification, all the other things, you can sort of build on that foundation of food and nutrition um, and then, you know, rebalance the body, the metabolism, all the other things from the inside out really, really effectively. Is there a difference, especially obviously for women, um, is there a difference between cycling and, and post-menopausal, excuse me, women, um, as far as like recommendations with a carnivore diet? You hear all the time that the cycling women, a certain time of the month, they need more carbohydrates than others. I, I get mixed opinions on this all the time. What are, what are some of the things you see with that? I love this question. So 
First and foremost, yes, the nutritional needs of a cycling female can definitely vary from postmenopausal female, even from perimenopausal. So perimenopausal is sort of that time in between when a woman is cycling regularly, regularly and when her cycle stops completely. This is the perimenopausal is like they have a cycle every 30 days and then it stops for nine months and they think they're almost there and then it starts again and then six more months and then it stops and sort of this sort of like on again, off again. Um, but as far as like just cycling in general, um, yes, our nutri our nutritional needs can change throughout our cycle. I teach a lot of cycling different strategies um, for the cycling female. Um, and I don't believe that every woman needs to add carbohydrates in the second part of their cycle to be successful. I find that they can make adjustments to protein and fat macros. Some women do better with more fat. Some do better with more protein. Some do better just cycling their food up, like the amount of food that they're eating overall. Um, some require more electrolytes. Some require more B vitamins. So uh, if they eat organ meats or liver, that can be helpful if they're open to, you know, supplementing uh, with B vitamins, B12, liver capsules, you know, something like that, that can be helpful. Um, but I don't, what I don't find is that they have to add carbs back in, um, to be successful. Now, if I do have clients that I think, oh yeah, they might benefit from some carbs. I'm actually having them add in animal carbs to start with. So I might have them in, you know, increase their amount of carbohydrates with Seafood, mussels, scallops, um, eggs have a little carbs. You know, some dairy, if they tolerate it, have a little carbs. So when I say, you know, oh, I might have someone add carbs, I'm not talking about 150 grams from a half a sweet potato. You know, I'm talking about a small amount and just playing with the other things that they're consuming and seeing what kind of results we can get that way. Um, a lot of clients I work with don't want either one, don't want to eat sweet potatoes or don't want to eat potatoes or don't want to eat 150 grams of carbs. I don't think that's realistic just to say like, oh yeah, every woman needs to do this to have their balance or cycle. Um, and also like for those ladies that do fall into the sort of abstainer category of like, they don't eat those foods because they'll trigger cravings and, you know, maybe even like binges and old behaviors. The last thing I want to do is have them eat a sweet potato. Um, so that's where some of those other um, strategies can come in of, you know, changing up the types of protein, the types of fat, again, with, you know, the amounts, the macro ratios, all, you know, the electrolytes, the salt, all those things are factors that we can kind of play with um, instead of adding carbs. Yeah, that's very helpful. Do you find that getting enough fat tends to be the biggest challenge for a lot of women, especially like I, I notice people will tell me like, yes, I'm eating the fatty meat, but then you press on a little bit to find out like how they're cooking the meat. And it's like, Oh, you're eating, you know, 80, 20 ground beef, but all the, all the fats rendering out things like that. I notice that all the time. Do you think that's a big problem? Um, so I think that women not getting enough fat is almost as much of a problem as women not getting enough protein. So I do find that there is the key of like, they, they either can't tolerate the rendered fats, so they drain it on purpose, but they're not adding the right fats back, or they just are sort of lacking with figuring out how much protein, getting enough protein. Now, that being said, I will say that compared to 10 years ago, um, they're getting way more protein than they were. Like definitely the consumption of protein has sort of, uh, increase and prioritizing protein, the context of that has increased tremendously over the last 10 years, which I am super happy about, um, just in general. But what I used to see years ago compared to now with protein is not as much of a problem. Um, but I do see that sometimes it can be challenging to get enough fat. Digestive issues can make that problematic when uh, digestion, digestion isn't optimized and they're having trouble with digestion, digesting fats. Um, and so, you know, I think just, um, again, I do see that as a problem sometimes, but I also see the consumption of enough protein. Like I'll have a lot of clients that could easily get the, um, the 90 to 90 gram mark, 90 to hundred gram mark in a day, but then they're trying to do OMAD or they're trying to fast, or they're trying to do all these fancy things before they're focused on, you know, that foundation and getting the right amount of food, which is a little, um, 
premature because we have to get the food right before we start to add the fancy stuff. Yeah, a really good point. I think um, I think I do like the approach that a lot of carnivores take where they talk about like priming when you're starting a carnivore diet, like you really need to eat a lot of food, have, you know, three meals rather than try to have the two. And it can be really difficult because the, the food that you eat on a carnivore diet is so satiating. So sometimes you can have a bit of a loss of hunger and it might be more difficult to add in those meals. But I think that is ultra critical in the beginning. Um, we did mention perimenopause and then, and then menopause, by the way, in the panel, I don't know if you remember one of the panelists, um, said that perimenopause like wasn't a thing. And it, I felt like there was going to be like a riot in that room, um, for, for, for women past menopause, um, do, do the food requirements change any, or do they kind of think about the same way that, that, that a cycling woman would? Um, I think with, okay. So postmenopause can definitely, women can definitely, um, do better on not cycling so many variables uh, for sure versus like a cycling woman and changing those variables throughout the first two weeks or second two weeks or weekly. Um, I kind of teach the coach on both, both of those sort of ways to strategize and change the variables. Um, that being said, obviously my, my practices, you know, probably 80 to 90% weight loss, fat loss, body composition and so what I also want to just um, caution ladies about that are postmenopause is that when we get stuck in doing the same things over and over again, even if they're not cycling, what can happen is they can create an adaptation. So that so if we if we get stuck doing the same things over and over again, the body's going to adapt and then it's not going to change. So it's like you wouldn't lift a five pound weight for months on end and expect you to, you're, you know, to expect you to be able to grow muscle. Well, some people might, but that's not, obviously we know that's not going to work. Um, so I think that in the postmenopausal group or that stage of life, um, while they don't necessarily need to cycle the variables the way a cycling woman would, it can be beneficial to cycle some variables strategically so that their bodies don't adapt and they can continue to progress whatever their goals are, longevity, health, body composition, muscle gains, things like that. Yeah, I like that. So so speaking of what we eat, when we go to the tracking side, this is very general and obviously everything you do is individualized and people are different. And you have to understand your client and understand what their needs are and what's going to benefit them. Sure. As far as tracking go, where do you lean? Do you lean more towards we, we really should track and we should try to hit these metrics and protein and fat and all the things we're looking at? Or is it more like I would really like you to be intuitive and eat the fatty meat when you crave it and eat the leaner meat when you crave it and have the chicken when you want that? Like, where do you generally tend to lean on that? Okay. So I, this is also one of my favorite questions. Um, so both, and it depends, right? So I am a hundred percent, probably more than a hundred percent believer in tracking. And I'll sort of explain my, my stance on this. And I'm also a big believer in intuitive eating. However, what I do find is that it's very hard to accurately become an intuitive eater when you haven't tracked first. So intuitive eating is, yes, knowing when you need leaner meats, knowing when you need more fats. But what happens if if we go into this, oh, I'm going to try to intuitively eat when our hunger cues are still messed up and there's a lot of things that are still out of balance is that the intuitive piece, while a lot of people make good effort, is they do and they might think they're intuitive eating, but the results don't um don't happen the, the the real results they're looking for don't happen from just intuitive eating without the tracking so i have sort of a you know years ago when i had to go from under eating to making sure i was eating enough on a daily basis um i had to flip my mindset of for tracking from let me track to eat as little as i could to survive i eat 1200 or 1000 calories to let me track so that I get enough food so that I know I'm getting what my body needs so that I can build muscle and I can change body composition, drop fat, all of those things. So I think that the big, one of the big things with tracking is a mindset shift of looking at why somebody should be doing that. Um, then learning what's right for them intuitive, uh, not intuitively, but what's right from the, for them from a metabolic standpoint how much protein, how much fat, how much total energy, uh, i.e. calories, I teach energy as calories, or excuse me, calories as energy, um, to kind of take that focus off the 
caloric in, intake kind of thing. Um, making sure that they're eating in, yes, I mean, other, here's another, you know, dare I say caloric def deficit versus calorie restriction, because I do think there's a difference between a calorie deficit and calorie restriction. Um, and then sort of using all of that data and information. And I'm not talking about just over a couple of days where someone may have tracked their food. I'm talking about over, you know, a few months even to longer than that to get to a place where, okay, I've done all this work. Um, and this is what I do with clients in my groups and my one-on-ones. Um, we do all this work and then they get to a place where, okay, this is what intuitive eating is. This is where I can, you know, maintain my results and, and all of that, knowing what I know now because of, I know how my body responds and, and all of the sort of work that goes into that. I love that. That's going to take a, quite a bit of effort. But when your body is intuitively telling you to eat an entire pizza and have the ice cream that you used to eat all the time after that, that's and that's what people think of intuitive eating. And we have that hope it's dying now, but that push for like the intuitive eating diet and you can eat whatever and your body will tell you, well, that's probably not going to work for most sugar addicts like myself. Like I will have an entire sleeve of Oreos and follow that up with an entire sleeve of Oreos. You know what I mean? Like when you are in carnivore, you can eat intuitively. It's a lot easier because you know what your foods are and you know what your foods are not, you know? Yeah, and I think even eating intuitively within carnivore, um, if someone has a metabolism and issues that are like, let's just say broken for, you know, lack of a better term at this point, um, eating till you're stuffed, eating until, you know, Thanksgiving full, all these terms that we hear on carnivore, um, I think that they can create a lot of problems for many people. They can also create problems for someone who comes from an under eating background and telling someone to eat till they're stuffed and eat all this food, eat three pounds of meat a day can also be super scary. So, you know, do some of these uh, recommendations work for many people out there? Of course, absolutely. We see it every day. But what we don't see more so, especially on social media, is all the people that this is not working for and that do need this sort of... Um, individualized, uh, you know, learn how to be intuitive because yes, eating intuitively could be three ribeyes for someone at a meal. And that's not what they need metabolically. You know, there's, I think we could like, we could literally talk for hours on this topic. Seriously. So I'll, I'll stop there. But yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that it's just, um, there's so many different directions to look at it. There, there are. Yeah. And I appreciate your opinion on that. And I believe it was Judy in the panel that we've been talking about that like really made the point of like, we're, we're learning this, we're figuring this out. Like we don't have all of the answers. Like we're, we're all in, we're doing this and answering these questions and we have differences of opinion, but we're, we're trying to sort this out. And you know, the, the, the people going through this are a big part of it and, and learning what is best for them is really important. All of this is kind of centered around the, t the topic of women and, and, and their hormones. And this gets brought up all the time and people have so many different opinions about it. I really, really appreciate the way you presented it. I can't remember when this was, but it was on Instagram and you presented the hormones into like five different kind of like main buckets. And if I get this right, I want to say it's insulin, leptin was one, uh, thyroid was one, I think adrenals were one, and I want to say that sex hormones were the, the five. Did I, did I get that? Yes, you got that. Nice. Awesome. Um, can you explain your thinking around that and where, where those things can be problematic. Yes. So there's, okay. So each, each of those hormone categories are again, its own category, but the thing of it is like, they all play together. So this is why test don't guess is my sort of approach is making sure that you look to see, or you test to see what the hormones are actually doing before making any major changes or supplementation or things like that. But for the most part, you know, all the hormones play together. So while we have to look at leptin and cortisol and adrenals and sex hormones and all the things, again, is um, looking at what they're going to be doing together and how they, they're affecting each other and then kind of going from there with what the best next steps are for each person. Got it. So... <sighs> I mean, this is, this is, so do you recommend that people get tested from the very beginning? Is that an investment that everybody should do from the beginning if they're starting to want to improve their health? A uh, million dollar question. So I don't think, I mean, to be really honest, I don't think that everyone has to get a hormone test when they first start. Um, I think that, I mean, I didn't, you know, I didn't, when I first started eating this way, it was before I knew about functional testing. 
my experience with all the testing started probably, let's see, like two, two and a half years after I was already doing this way of eating keto, low carb. Um, so is it beneficial to know what your hormones are doing? Of course it is. But if that's something that feels overwhelming and like someone doesn't want to worry about that, then I wouldn't, I would eat animal based foods, I would focus on getting the junk out of the house out of the diet overcrowding your current foods with all the the steak and the chicken and the shrimp and the seafood and the you know, any whatever animal based foods work for you. And then kind of going from there in terms of testing, then once you get to a point where maybe things are stalled, or they're not moving as much, or you're feeling like, you know, things don't have to be stalled to look at data, right? Like maybe you are doing well and you're like, this is great. I want to, I want to go like next level and see what that next level would look like testing wise. Um, And then sort of making a determination to look at, you know, blood work or urine testing or whatever the testing is. I have various ways I like to look at different things. So I like to kind of think of it as a wise investment. If you really want to cut to the chase, like I think most people can kind of sort it out over time. And they, if they're really, you know, getting, getting better at being intuitive over time, they can kind of figure out the foods and and you'll be okay with it. Like a, a carnivore kind of foundation, but you might flounder around a lot more. You might, you might, it might take you much longer where I look at testing as like, I'm going to go right to the, right to the information. I want to know exactly where to focus. And, and yeah, it's a bit of an investment, but if you're looking to get the best start and the best direction, that's pretty much the way to go. Is that a good way to say that? Yes, I I mean, I wholeheartedly agree. I just like to be a little conservative sometimes. And I don't want people to think that they can only do this way of eating if they get tests done. So financially, some people won't be able to do that. And that's okay. Then go out and spend your money on eggs and ground beef and whatever works for your budget without having to feel like you have to get blood work done for this to be successful. Flip side, of course, I love testing. I love the data. I love like, okay, point A, point B, point C. Here's how we're going to get there. Here's the protocol. Here's the, what we're going to do with food, all the things. But again, I just like to, you know, sometimes like to be a little bit conservative and I don't want anyone to ever think, um, oh, I'm not going to stop this, start this way of eating because I can't go get a blood test or, you know, I can't get this fancy, whatever, whatever yeah. kind of thing. Fair point. I really appreciate that. For the listener that mm-hmm. is thinking like, okay, I know all about blood work. I went to my doctor to get blood work done. Mm-hmm. It was a few years ago. They said this value was a little high. This value was a little low. I don't even know if I got my numbers. They just kind of mentioned a few things and I don't know where they are. I can't access them. That doesn't really seem like a high value. What is the difference in what you were kind of talking about as far as like assessing all of it with you versus what somebody would probably have as an experience going to their normal medical doctor? So first and foremost, anything that a medical doctor is going to look at is going to be the normal reference range, which is going to be based on the typical population. And I will say that, of course, many people in our population are sick metabolically. So you're in the normal reference and they're going to say your blood work is normal. Okay, fine. So with that being said, remember there's, you know, I'll, I'll back this up by saying there's a time and place for a medical doctor. Um, however, everyday symptoms are typically not going to be what they're going to recognize as problematic. So they're going to say, oh, you're, this is in the normal reference range, similar to the experience I, that I had years ago. Normal reference range, and it's all in your head, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. Well, then why do I still feel like crap? So when I look at blood work or other testing, I'm looking for optimal. So if a normal reference range, let's say is, uh, you know, 200 to 500, I'm looking for optimal, which might be 350 to 450. So it's a much smaller range. And so therefore, in a medical range, you might still be in the normal reference, which is great, because they're typically looking for degenerative issues, diseases, things like that. And it's good to be normal and cleared of all of that. But that doesn't mean you're your labs are optimal or you're feeling optimal, which is my goal is to get you feeling optimal. So with that said, then it's what markers is that doctor running? So things like fasting, insulin, and leptin, some of these doctors, number one, have never heard of some of these markers. 
Number two, they won't run them unless you have a significant history of, let's say, take fasting insulin, diabetes in the family, um, and or other maybe heart conditions if you're lucky, um, and therefore won't run these markers to save anyone's life. Yeah. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> Um, so that is another problem as far as that goes. So you might get like the super basics, maybe, you know, a, a complete metabolic panel, maybe a CBC. Um, but that said, like when I run blood work, the comprehensive blood work, just as a baseline foundation that I'm running is like 91 total markers, fasting, insulin, homocysteine, leptin, adiponectin, you know, ferritin, iron panel, like all the metabolic stuff. And then you know, the other piece of the puzzle is correlating everything together. Exactly. So not only is why is this, why isn't this optimal, but it's okay, this one isn't optimal, but what are all these other areas doing? What is liver detox doing? What is the gut doing? What is the, you know, blood sugar? Is there hidden, you know, I see hidden blood, blood sugar dysregulation all the time where fasting glucose looks normal. Uh, insulin even looks normal. But then there's maybe a issue with C peptide or other metabolic um, dysfunction that's showing me there still might be hidden insulin resistance, and that could be the reason why someone's not losing weight or not sleeping at night or not having a resolution to their autoimmune, you know, issue, whatever that is. So there's a lot of factors, but hope, hopefully that helps a little bit. <laughs> it's it's perfect. And I think that's where the money is and where you know you found a really good practitioner. When they're not just looking at isolation at one marker, they're looking at the constellation of all the different markers and seeing how everything interacts with each other. And then they're able to, even if they don't come up with like the exact best answer, it might be like we have some clues and a direction that we can take steps into. Um, and, and I think that is so much more valuable than just getting markers that are in isolation. Yes, absolutely. And I think that, you know, a lot of it is the education of all of this. Like some don't even realize that there's other ways to look at blood work, that there's other functional testing. Like, like people say, like, what is functional testing? I'm like, well, if you're not feeling like you're functioning well on a daily basis, we're going to look at reasons why that's happening. So what's going on with the gut? What's going on with hormones aside from, um, uh, like a blood panel, you know, I like urine testing to look at, I just actually talked about this in my stories this morning, like how hormones are being metabolized down the pathways. What is happening? Like, what are the nitty gritty details? And, you know, this is all, obviously we're getting into fancy talk right now. Like I was just talking about like the fancy versus just the food part. Um, but there's like so much potential here, especially for women who maybe have been carnivoring for a long time. And they're like, I can't carnivore any harder. And I'm still not losing weight, or I'm still not sleeping at night, or everyone else feels so good on carnivore, but I don't, I don't understand what's wrong with me. Well, there might not be anything wrong with you, you know, in the context of doing carnivore correctly, there just might be some things that need to be looked at differently. I really love that. So we mentioned all of those five buckets and we're not going to have the time or the breadth to be able to go in depth with all of sure. those. Um, the two that stand out to me the most, obviously, you know, there, there's going to be issues with lots of women with their thyroid and the sex hormones. And all, we see that all the time, but the two that really jump out at me would be insulin and leptin. As far as like insulin seems to me, like at this point, it's kind of the easier one to kind of understand knowing that most people are probably insulin resistant. That comes from way too many carbohydrates in the diet and we probably just need to bring that down is that i mean it's more complicated than that but is that kind of the general gist when it comes to insulin yeah i would say definitely that's a very good uh, synopsis exactly keep it more simple leptin is kind of this newer kid on the block we didn't even know it existed all that long ago um and people are now talking about leptin resistance and it's starting to get a little bit more attention can you talk about leptin in particular and what it is what it does and what is leptin resistance yeah, so leptin is our satiety hunger, uh, hunger, <laughs> our satiety hormone. Um, leptin helps us signal to our brain that the body is full and satisfied. So if we have leptin resistance, leptin resistance can happen when leptin levels are too high or too low. And that basically is like I was maybe describing earlier, I used to have excessive hunger and cravings. I mean, I could eat massive quantities of food and still eat massive quantities of food after that. And I'm not talking about just like sugar and it was like a sugar craving. It was like large meals at 
restaurants with very big servings and I could eat a lot of food. Um, and so that's sort of a, a leptin resistance where there's just that hunger signal is completely broken. Therefore, the body doesn't know when to stop eating. So that's where I was talking about earlier. Um, even somebody with leptin resistance could potentially overeat on carnivore. I mean, there's some people that say, oh, you can't overeat meat. Well, I promise you, you can. I promise you can, because I work with people that have uh, experienced that and gained weight from being told to just eat three to four pounds of meat a day and they'll naturally rebalance. Yet then they come to me 40 pounds heavier and they're like, but I did what I was told. And I'm like heavier than I was when I started. Sorry, I'm a little on a tangent here. But now if we kind of circle back, that low leptin can come from chronic yo-yo dieting, chronic under eating, um, even uh, eating disorder history. So that's also problematic. And so the leptin resistance is really just sort of a term of like your body is resistant to what leptin should be doing. It should be signaling the brain, but if it's too high or too low, that signal is broken. Got it. Okay. That was a really good explanation. When, when we're talking about, you know, the things you talk about food, food first, let's start with the food. Let's get the food down. Sometimes that's not enough. We need other things, especially things like supplementation. I, spent so many years selling supplements and making a spiff off supplements. And I thought everybody needed the multi and the fish oil and all of these things. And now I really kind of think like, okay, there better damn well be a good reason why you're taking a supplement. There, there should be a reason that you're doing that. And you should try to get a good one. If you're going to do it, what is your opinion on supplementation? I love it. So I love this question. That's what I meant when I said I love it. I love this question. So my opinion on supplementation is that it should be used as it's as the title is, supplemental. So no supplements can outweigh a diet. You can't take supplements and eat fast food and expect results to happen. So again, food first, build that foundation, the right amount of animal-based foods, protein and fats, carbs if you're going to eat them, make sure that they're good quality, low oxalate, all the things. Then as far as supplementation, I think that some people can benefit from the general multi or the general B vitamin or the general electrolyte minerals, things like that, magnesium, even, even I'll go so far as to say digestive enzymes, HCL kind of thing. Um, but beyond that should be based on their blood work, their deficiencies, their gut health, what's going on, really not just guessing of like, oh, you know, I need this long list of things because I think that I need this long list of things, you know? Um, and then like with clients that I work with um, on testing blood work protocols, like everything on that side of things, everything is based on their blood work, their testing, everything is strategized. So different phases of protocols um, have different purposes. We were where we work on different things. The strategy changes every 30, 60, 90 days. There's, here's a good one. There, because I hear this a lot, there's a start date to when we start the protocols and there's an end date. So they're not just given this list of things that, that the practitioner adds to and adds to. They have no idea why they're taking it. I get this all the time. People come to me like on this long list. Oh, I'm on all these things. Why are you taking them? I have no idea. <laughs> well, when did they tell you to stop? I have no idea. Well, you know, and like they have literally no idea why they're taking this entire list of things. So we get them off the long list again, strategize what they need, a period of time, 30, 60, 90 days. Why are they taking it? There's an end date. Do they want to retest? Like all those things are factored in for supplementation. So the short answer is yes, I for sure believe in supplementation. And I've been uh, very much criticized for this, especially in the carnivore world, um, because if you're eating the perfect you know, human diet, why do you need supplementation? But how did we get to the place where we want to eat carnivore? Well, we have hormone issues. We have gut issues. We have thyroid issues. Well, that's hormone issues. We have absorption problems, leaky gut, you know, underlying things going on. So someone doesn't walk into carnivore with perfect absorption, perfect digestion. I have tons of carnivores, one to two year carnivores who are B vitamin deficient, who are iron deficient, who have leaky gut. You know, I mean, the list goes on. And so that's why I'm so, I feel like I'm like, you know, so passionate about 
this topic because it's so frowned upon, but when it's in the context for the person and what they have going on, uh, and you're using good quality supplements, you're not just going to the warehouse store and trying to buy in quantity um, because they're selling on, you know, marketing and label and how pretty the label is not, you know, supplements that have been tested prior to during after lab work and looking at do they really work. So obviously when it comes to supplementation, pro professional brands, professional recommendations, all those things are going to play a role as well. Perfect. I love getting my podcast guests like really wound up about a topic they're passionate about. And I, okay, good. <laughs> I love it. No, I, I've said, I've said, you know, recently, like you probably would never need a carnivore diet if we were just living the way we were supposed to. Anyway, too many things have changed in the context. It wouldn't be a carnivore diet. It'd just be food. What food are you going to have? Like sometimes you might get some fruit at certain parts of the year that are vastly different than fruits that we have today. Most of your diet would have by requirement come from animal products. We could have just eaten that way and nobody would need the quote unquote carnivore diet. It's, we had we've gotten here because we're sugar addicted. There's sugar everywhere. There's seed oils everywhere. We're a mess, you know? And so some people like you or I just do better when we keep it very simple and just keep it to a carnivore diet. We probably would have never needed that in, in, you know, past times essentially. Yeah. And I think that sort of plays into, I, um, uh, at the time we're recording this, I talked about something, a similar Thing in my stories this morning, um, because I do talk a lot about detoxification and optimizing detoxification um, through various strategies and, and ways and things like that. And one of the sort of um, areas of pushback, especially in the functional space, um, is, you know, you shouldn't have to take things to help your body detox. You, you know, you have a liver, the liver does what it's supposed to do. You shouldn't be having to do supplements and, you know, things, strategies, methodologies to help the body do that. The freaking reality is that we have toxic food. We have toxic, toxic environment. We have, you know, exposure to pathogens, mold, mycotoxins, all the things that plague the body and that sort of back things up. So, you know, even when I have clients that do they've been carnivore for a year or two and they go on their protocol and they're like, I never thought that I would have detox symptoms because I was so clean before and they do. And they're just feeling so much better and their skin clears up and all these things, you know, happen. And even weight loss can happen from detoxing because our body holds onto toxins in different ways. So that's yeah. another area that yeah. I pull her. <laughs> I love it. needs to be a <laughs> I love it. No. And, and, you know, I look around in the health space and it's so easy to do in social media now with all these other things that, that we can do that look amazing, like different workouts that we can do. We can get saunas and we can get cold plungers are getting really popular. Um, intermittent fasting is becoming very popular and it's cool because these are things that can help certain people with certain things. But I do worry a little bit that if some is good, more is better. And especially women who might be successful and they're working really hard and they're doing the intermittent fasting and they're doing the cold plunges and they're doing saunas. And they're like, I, I, I worry that all of it can kind of add up and really be a very difficult load of stress to get over. Is that something you deal with all the time? Yeah. So that's what I say. Usually what I say is like too many hormetic stressors are too many hormetic stressors. So I think that, you know, the cold, like I, it's all great stuff. The cold plunging, the infrared sauna. I, I have a sauna. I love my sauna. I am not a big cold plunger. Do, will I take, you know, alternating hot and cold showers? Yes. Do I swim in a pool that, you know, some days is colder than others and that's a cold enough plunge for me? Yes. Uh, but just in general, yes, we get into the extended fasting and the intermittent fasting and then the under eating, and then they have a history of under eating and then they're trying to, in, you know, infrared sauna and then they're cold plunging. It's like enough is enough. Less is more a hundred percent. And, you know, just, there's so much good and bad influence from social media, seeing all these good things yet, it, you know, again, I'll just say in context of the person, metabolically what they can tolerate and all of that so you know there are times when cold plunging is going to be stressful for someone who has thyroid imbalances and they're naturally cold all the time because their thyroid isn't working properly and could the same person do cold cold plunges and benefit from it 
Definitely. So again, nuance, context, individuality, always, always, you know, sort of, I should say takes, I was gonna say takes the cake, but takes the steak, takes the you steak. know, um, you know, in terms of, you know, what to look at and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Very well explained there as well. Tell us how you're working with people. We mentioned in the introduction, you're working with individuals. You also work with groups. I think your group programs sound really engaging and interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about how you're working with people these days? Yeah, absolutely. So I have my one on my one on one practice. Um, I work with clients uh, one on one from all over over Zoom. We do um, blood work and functional testing, and everything is sort of dialed in for the individual um, person. I have different programs that include different, you know, coaching amount of coaching sessions, testing, all of that. Um, I have my group program, the Weight Loss Accelerator Program. So that is an online group where I cover um, individualized uh, macros and a lot of different topics in a group setting. Um, a lot of benefit there. The ladies get the benefit of the individualized coaching in the group setting, but they also get the benefit of the Q&A and hearing the answers to all the other ladies' questions and struggles. And maybe they don't know they have a question until someone someone else asks and then the answer resonates with them. So it helps them as well. So that's always, um, I love the groups. And then I'm excited because I am in the process of creating a, uh, my current group does not include any blood work or testing, um, but I am hopefully going to be releasing a program later this year that will be a um, small exclusive group that will actually also include blood work as well. So I'm looking forward to that. So it's exciting. Yeah, that's that's exciting. When we were working for a big corporate gym, um, they would make us do like, like short term. It was about the same length of time It was about eight weeks, 60 days of a weight loss contest. We would give people, you know, the standard whole grains and vegetables and it, it, it sucked. It would never work. And so it basically we kind of did our own thing. My wife and I, we would just give people low carbohydrate meal plans, teach them how to do keto and carnivore if they wanted to. We got great results. It was awesome. And part of that is we would do like seminars with the people that signed up with us. They could come and do a seminar with us. And in the group, I I was, I would, I don't know why I was surprised by this. It was really engaging, but I, I found that over time, the group wanted to hear less and less and less from me and really appreciated the group setting and hearing from themselves and somebody that had maybe started three months earlier than another person could give them advice and they could talk and workshop things more than me, like telling people exactly what they had to do. It's more like you need to be in a community and talk about this. I'm, I'm sure you get a lot of that in your group as well. Yeah, definitely. I think the community aspect is really important. Um, and then in in the weight loss accelerator, which is my group program, I find that a lot of the women, they've been in some communities and they've been in some groups, but um, there's a lot of just misinformation out there and um, not, uh, let's say, uneducated people running, you know, running the show, so to speak, and not necessarily having sort of the background and being able to sort of guide people in the same way. Um, they often have also said that they don't necessarily feel safe in some of the bigger communities um, to be able to share those details and that kind of stuff, too. So that all is um, you know, important to me and kind of maintaining that um, that uh, type of community for, you know, these women, like I said, mostly, you know, like you said earlier, I do work with all kinds of individuals, but majority of my clients are, you know, midlife women over 40. Yeah, that's great. It's funny feedback about the bigger groups online. I, I made the mistake of like posting a picture of my dinner one time and it had like a sliver of a, of a, an avocado or something on the <laughs> plate. And yeah, it was, it wasn't the vegans. It was the carnivores that came after me hard. So yeah, that's really good advice. Uh, Danny, this has been amazing. This has been a really cool conversation. I'm a little disappointed. You didn't tell us all exactly what to eat, but the, it's the nuance. It, it is what what makes this fun and it makes coaches like you so valuable uh, practitioners like you like to be able to work with people on the individual needs and, and what to do and when and what you can play with and workshopping things is really awesome. Can you tell our listeners where they can go to find you and connect with you and your work? Yes, absolutely. So I'm um, on Instagram at carnivore.keto.fitness. I do tons of Q and a and my stories and I like to share educational information on my posts uh, on my website, nutritionthenaturalway.com. Um, email direct is danny at nutritionthenaturalway.com. And I do also have a keto and carnivore Facebook group as well. So I like to hang out in all those places. And I do uh, tell my, my individual clients and the ladies in my groups exactly what to eat. So there's a little uh, <laughs> perfect. 
Continue for you. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. Uh, and, and we did talk about KetoCon. It is rebranding to Hack Your Health. If somebody did want to attend, I believe you have a code that you could um, give them and they could save a few bucks. Absolutely. So that code is natural way. I will, I'm very excited to join the carnivore panel again this year. It's troubleshooting the carnivore diet. And I will, um, Judy Cho will be hosting the panel and it will be myself, Dr. Lisa Wiedemann, carnivore doctor and Dr. Baker and Dr. Sarah Zaldivar as well. So very excited to be amongst that um, very smart group of um, carnivore uh, advocates. Not, not bad. It's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> I hope, exactly. I hope Robin learned the lesson to get a bigger room this time. Yes, we're uh, we're looking forward to being on the main stage this year. So I, I hope to it. see everyone. There. I love it. Uh, well, again, this has been an awesome conversation. Thank you very much, Danny, for taking the time to be with us. Your journey uh, through health has been, um, you know, long and 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 I don't know. I, you've gone through a lot, and to be able to share that now in a way that people can really relate to is really helpful. So thank you so very much for all of your work, and thank you for coming on our show today. We appreciate you. Absolutely, Casey. Thanks so much for having me. It was great. Absolutely. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio. Thank you so very much for continuing to listen to Boundless Body Radio. As 2023 has come to a close and we're starting another new year in 2024, I always try to reflect on not only the direction that we want to go in the future, but also how much we have grown in this last year. Our podcast has now generated well over 400,000 downloads from all over the world, and it's all thanks to fantastic listeners like yourself. I hope you are as excited for the new year as we are around here. The lineup of guests that we have coming up is absolutely staggering, and we're always striving to bring you the best content from the most amazing people in health, nutrition, and wellness. Remember that you can always head on over to our website to book a complimentary 30-minute session with us at myboundlessbody.com. On our homepage, there is a book now button where you can select a time to speak with us about your health and fitness plan, especially for the new year. We've absolutely loved chatting with so many of you out there to bounce ideas off each other and try to come up with plans to help you achieve specific goals. And seriously, I really do mean this. Even if it's just to say hello and introduce yourself, we absolutely love connecting with our listeners in the community. Be sure to check out our YouTube channel as well if you want to watch these full interviews and also shorter interviews on more specific topics that are taken from these interviews. We've gotten really great feedback over there, and it's also a really fun way to interact with people who comment. We read and reply to every single YouTube comment we get, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and leave as many comments as you like to keep the conversation going. And of course, if you haven't already, please leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It really is the best way to make sure that the podcast gets out to more listeners. Your five-star ratings and reviews are the best way to support us here at Boundless Body and to support the podcast at Boundless Body Radio really only takes a moment and it's very meaningful to us. Cheers to 2024 and thank you again for listening to Boundless Body Radio.